Now, the other thing that has driven the growth of this, and something that I have been, uh, has become my kind of personal hobby in the last 15 years for some reason, I don't know why that is, right, uh, has been the growth of contract pharmacies. In other words, pharmacies that are independent businesses contracting with a covered entity to fulfill a product at the 340B price. Um, and this has been a, become a very controversial part of the market, but it's important to understand how quickly it's grown and what is happening. Uh, HRSA, of course, has not issued regulations about contract pharmacies. It's issued guidance. And four years after the program started, at the request of a number of covered entities who said, I don't, I don't have a pharmacy. How am I going to get use these outpatient drugs? And HRSA said, well, you know, you could contract with someone and they can do it for you. And then five years later, they began a series of demonstration projects to expand the number of contract pharmacies that a covered entity could use. They issued a proposed guidance in 2007, and then 2010, they issued final guidance that said, you know what, we thought about it, and you can have as many contract pharmacies as you would like. Now, this guidance is separate, technically, from the Affordable Care Act. This is not part of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, at the time of this guidance, in 2010, as I mentioned, there were 1,300 pharmacies acting as contract pharmacies for covered entities. Um, since the initiation of that guidance, between 2010 and 2024, that number has grown from 1,300 to 33,000. That is more than half of all pharmacy locations in the United States are participating in the 340B program. Okay. Uh, but that is actually underestimating what is really happening. One of the things that we've done is look at the number of relationships between covered entities and pharmacies, because an individual contract pharmacy location can work with multiple covered entities. And when we first looked at it, the very first analysis I did of this, um, which you may, may remember is 2013, it was the first year that the very first Despicable Me movie came out with the minions. And that was the image I used in the blog, because I was counting all the minions. And at the time, there were tw about 12,000 contract pharmacies. So just in three years, it went from 12, 1,300 to 12,000, uh, 13,000, excuse me, it went from 1,300 to 13,000 in just three years. And those 13,000 pharmacies had about 32,000 relationships. So each location on average had two to three covered entities that they worked with. They were mainly retail pharmacies. Since then, We've been tracking every year the number of relationships. And here's what we found. So it's gone from 13,000 pharmacies to 33,000 pharmacies, but the number of covered entity relationships has gone from 32,000 to 220,000. Now, I'm no rocket surgeon, but I can see a trend there, and I imagine you can too. And you'll notice there's an inflection point around 2017, 2018, 2019. That was about the time that the pharmacy benefit managers began to be much more actively involved in the 340B program. And that was primarily via male and specialty pharmacies. And if you look at what's happening today, a typical retail pharmacy will have three to six uh, covered entities that it'll work with. A number of retail pharmacies work with just a single covered entity but a lot of them work with a literal handful, five. Uh, infusion sites, which are a minority of the 340B contract pharmacy market, um, have, you know, 10 to 30. Male and specialty pharmacies have, on average, a few hundred relationships, but is sometimes have a few thousand relationships, uh, often a thousand or more relationships. So the growth of this program has been driven not by just the number of pharmacies, but by the number of relationships each individual pharmacy location has. Um, and that has really been a function of the PBMs getting in the game. And today, when we look at that 220,000 relationships, five companies account for three quarters of all of those relationships. And they're probably companies that you guess, if you read drug channels, I guess you know, so it's not like a big surprise, but it's still interesting, I think. Um, CVS Health, uh, Walgreens Boots Alliance, Walmart, 
Express Script, which is part of Cigna, of course, and OptumRx, which is part of United Health Group. The three largest pharmacy chains and the three largest PBMs account for 75% of all contract pharmacy covered entry relationships. Now, the other thing that I want to point out to you, which I have not seen anyone else talk about, but I find very interesting, not just because I'm a nerd, but because I find this stuff kind of cool, uh, is that the federal grantees are primarily aligned with the retail pharmacies. That's the orange bar you see in the screen. And look at CVS and Walgreens. Nearly all of their retail pharmacy locations are part of the 340B program. And each, on average, those locations have about three to four relationships with covered entities. So you'll see that equals a little more than 30,000 covered entity contract pharmacy relationships. So it's driven by retail. But if you look at what's happening with hospitals, uh, the second column, they are primarily aligned with the male and specialty pharmacies of the largest PBMs. <clears throat> uh, and that has been one of the biggest growth areas. And part of the attraction of this business to the PBMs and to pharmacies in general, but particularly for PBMs, is that that is the primary source of specialty dispensing. You've seen my market share data. I put it up earlier this week as a rerun on drug channels on Tuesday, maybe to keep it fresh in your mind, that the largest PBMs are also the largest specialty pharmacies. And the largest 340B spreads are going to exist for specialty drugs that are dispensed under the pharmacy benefit. And the margin or profit that a pharmacy can earn as part of this program is sometimes, on average, we estimate, three to four times what they'll earn being a pharmacy for a traditional commercial plan. And there's a lot of data on this. I've published uh, links to some of these contracts on, the, on drug channels. Uh, there's been studies by the GAO and others who've looked at this. But essentially, by trading a prescription from a commercial fulfillment to a uh, 340B fulfillment, the fees increase. Uh, and that's been a big profit driver. That's one of the reasons we estimate that more than half of PBM's profits now derive from activities in their specialty pharmacy. There's other things in there, maximizers and GPO fees and other kinds of things. But 340B is a component of this. And uh, I want to give you a, a specific example, because this is, again, going to, I think, illuminate what is really happening here. And one of the reasons it's so controversial and one of the reasons this is a more complicated story than you might think. Let's consider a specialty prescription. And I've, I've made some simplifications just to illustrate the example. Imagine that's a specialty prescription that's $5,000, single prescription, a typical specialty drug. The patient has a coinsurance of 25%, $1,250. The manufacturer offers a rebate of 30%. The remaining 45% of the script cost, in this case, $2,250, is paid by the health plan. Now, I've eliminated a lot of other fees and complexity just to illustrate the core here. That's the basic story. Now, what if, and if you as the patient with your coinsurance go to your pharmacy or get it from a male and specialty pharmacy, you'll, re you'll be owed that $1,250. And the plan will pay the pharmacy, or the PBM that works for the plan will pay the pharmacy that uh, $5,000, and then there's a rebate after the fact. That's all kind of plain vanilla drug channels 101. But what if, after the fact, that script is determined to be 340B eligible? Now, there are no standards as to how quickly that script can be determined to be 340B eligible. Different covered entities have different standards as to which kinds of patients are going to be classified as eligible or not. But at some point, this script, in looking through the pharmacy switch data, is identified as a 340B eligible prescription. At that point, it can be flipped to a identified 340B claim. Now, there's two assumptions hidden in here. Number one, that the manufacturer and the PBM have agreed that if there is a 340B discount on the script, they do not owe a formulary rebate. Uh, not every manufacturer has that agreement, so they may be paying twice. Uh, but let's assume they have that and that it has been identified to the manufacturer uh, as a 340B claim. If that happens, the manufacturer says, well, you know, hey, no rebate, no problem. Now, the plan is now paying more of the cost of that script. 
In this case, the plan is now paying essentially 75% of the cost of that script. Where does that money go? And I'll show you some typical representative numbers that are, I think, reasonably accurate as a, as a sense of what's happening here. Um, let's assume that the pharmacy, or the, excuse me, the covered entity, can buy that drug for 60% less than the list price, which is roughly the reimbursement, so 40%. On average, a contract pharmacy might be earning 16% of that prescription value. Now, a normal specialty script might have a margin that's in the low single digits, 3% maybe. But here, they might be earning 16%, uh, both because, because they're allowed to keep a portion of that reimbursement. And the covered entity receives the remainder, $2,200. Now, I'm highlighting this example because this is an example where using a contract pharmacy, the covered entity doesn't physically touch the drug, doesn't provide any pharmacy services, doesn't dispense the drug, uh, doesn't even know about it until maybe after the fact, after adjudication, maybe weeks, or possibly even months later. So who is paying that 340B discount? Well, the manufacturer has provided that discount, but the funds end up coming from the third-party payer, coming from the plan, and in many cases, coming from the patient. So uh, this is the kind of example, the kind of issue that shows you the 340B has a lot of complicated impacts on both private commercial payers and the patient. Um, if this is a Medicare patient, for example, that means the government is paying this amount and the funds are going to the 340B covered entity. Now, I'm not saying anything about whether that's right or wrong. This is just the facts. And you could see some of the controversy here, which has led to what, what has been going on in the last few years.